guys, months. That is how long I have been thinking about tonight. That is how long I've been praying about tonight. Months, and I am so excited that it is finally here. You are finally here. I have been praying for you, each and every one of you. What a privilege it is to be here to kick off the Steubenville Conference season with you all. I'm so excited. I, I just, I wanna pray one more time before I get started real quick, I promise. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit, teach us how to pray. Lord Jesus, we invite you tonight into our hearts and into our minds. I invite you to be my words tonight, Lord. Please speak through me. We are so grateful for the gift of this weekend. May we be able to hear your voice during our time together. In your name we pray, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So have you ever been in a situation where you felt a little bit um, out of place? One of those situations where you feel like you don't belong? Well, recently, I was reminded of a situation like this in my life. You see, I was taking my son, my 10-year-old son, Paul, to a birthday party, and it was a birthday party at a laser tag place. And we pull up, and I'm going inside, and I realize I have been here before. Yeah, I have been to this laser tag place. You see, 15 years prior, when I was dating my husband, Kevin, so my boyfriend, now my husband, Kevin, we came out to Denver, Colorado. We weren't living there at the time, although I do live there now. We came out to Denver, Colorado to visit his sister, and his sister had this idea. She said, let's go play laser tag. And we're like, okay, sounds good. I'm the girlfriend, right? I'm not gonna object to the cool older sister saying, let's go play laser tag. So we go to play laser tag, and we show up, and we get our tickets, we go into the briefing room, we're getting all of our gear, and I look around and I realize, we have crashed a 10-year-old boy's birthday party. <laughs> feeling a little out of place, feeling a little bit like I don't belong. The three of us adults and these 10-year-old kids. And here's the thing, I have this weird thing with competition where if I don't know somebody, I have a hard time competing against them because I feel bad for them. Okay, I never played sports, good thing, right? Wouldn't have gone well. I was on the dance team instead. So I'm looking at these kids and I'm like, I don't wanna ruin their self-esteem. <sighs> Gosh, which one's the birthday boy? Like definitely don't tag him, right? And I'm feeling a little awkward about this game. So we go in there and we play laser tag and we come back out and we're looking at the scoreboard. And um, apparently my boyfriend, now husband, did not have the same hangup that I have <laughs> because he dominated, okay, first place. He's like, take that 10 year olds, right? <laughs> Kelly is somewhere in the middle, respectably. And I, as you can guess, am dead last. Like dead last, like I almost didn't even score. And they're like, what happened? I'm like, I don't know, I just felt bad. I just, I don't know these kids, right? Like the sibling of the birthday boy, the five year old sibling of the birthday boy beat me. Okay, everybody felt good about themselves that night, okay? So if you ever need a pick me up at some point during this conference, you just, just challenge me to like, uh, thumb more or something, and you will win. And you know, that's how we'll do this, okay? So yeah, we've all had those situations, those places where we felt a little bit out of place, a little bit like we don't belong. If you've ever started a new school, you know this feeling, you know what that's like, especially at lunchtime, right? You've got your tray, you're walking in, and you're like, where am I supposed to sit? I don't know where I belong. Or if you've joined a sports team and you look around, and you're like, yeah, there's this group and this group and this group, and I don't really know where I fit in here. Where do I belong? Or if you've ever been to a Steelers game and you see that one guy dressed up in all Ravens gear, you're like, yeah, he doesn't belong. He does not belong here, that's right. Or maybe, just maybe, you've been in a situation where um, your mom signed you up for this Jesus thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> go mom, right? She signed you up for this Jesus thing and you show up and everybody's there wearing their matching Jesus t-shirts, right? and they're really excited to be there, and you're looking around and you're like, nope, this is not where I belong. If that is you, I totally understand. I totally understand, because my sophomore year in high school, my mom did that very thing to me. She signed me up for a Jesus thing. It was a week long spring break camp. And it was a little tricky here. See, so I show up, and first I'm looking around and I'm like, when did my mom stop loving me? <laughs> like, why did she make me do this? Because there's a bunch of people there with their Jesus t-shirts. And during the day, we did really cool stuff. We'd go zip lining, we'd go caving, we did high ropes course, but then at night, we talked about Jesus. And I remember, I'd never seen this before. There's a group there, it was a Protestant group, and their youth pastor had a guitar. And they were all singing these songs. 
I'd never seen this before. I'm like, what, what are they doing? Because there were some kids who, like, they had their hand on their heart, and their eyes were closed, and their hand was raised. And I was like, what is wrong with those kids? Like, <laughs> does that kid, like, have a question? Like, does he need something? Like, does he need to go to the bathroom? Because I don't think you have to ask to go to the bathroom here. I just think you can go. I don't really know what's going on here, right? So I was feeling a little uncomfortable at this Jesus thing, feeling a little bit out of place. So if that's you, I totally get it. I have been here. But here's the thing. For as awkward as some of you may feel, if there is anywhere that you belong, it's here. If there is anywhere that you belong, it's here. Because here you are surrounded by your crazy, big, sometimes messy family. And this family, it's not just for those who actually like to wear their Jesus t-shirts. It's not for those who pray before every meal and snack. It's not just for those who every Sunday are at St. Mary's Church at nine o'clock sitting in the fourth pew on the left for mass. You know, you know who you are. Those of you who are like, this is my pew. Don't touch my pew. <laughs> You're gonna have to take the death stare of my mom if you sit in my pew, right? That's right, it's not just for those people, it's for all of us. And this family that we have, just like every family, has a dad. And our dad happens to be the God of the universe. That's right, he happens to be the God of the universe. And he has one goal for you in this life. One goal, and that is that one day you will be with him forever in heaven. But you see, that's all he's ever wanted, is to be with you. From the beginning of time, that's all he's ever wanted, is to be with you. You see, God created this earth for no other reason than out of love. God is love, and he had so much love that just like poured out everywhere. And he said, with this love, I'm going to create you. And so he created Adam and Eve and he, he put them in the garden. And at night they got to walk together. They got to be together. It was everything that God had dreamed of and planned when he created out of love. And he made them in his image and his likeness. Now this does not mean that one day when you get to heaven, because you too were made in God's image and likeness, that you're going to look up at God on his throne and be like, huh, I get it. I have his nose. That's, yep. <laughs> No, that is not what it means to be made in his image and likeness. It means that we share certain attributes that God has. And included in that is the fact that we have an intellect and we have a will. So our intellect is what gives us the ability to think and to reason, to do things like algebra. Animals can't do algebra, right? And we have a will. Our will is what gives us the ability to choose. And that will is what we call free. It's free will. You see, God, when he created us, he didn't want to make us his minions. He didn't want to say, okay, you have to love me. You have no choice but to love me, because that wouldn't be love. And so because of this free will, he placed in the center of the garden a tree. And he said to Adam and Eve, this tree right here, this tree, I need you to listen to me. Do not eat from this tree. But we all know what happens, right? Adam and Eve chose against God. They chose not to trust him. They chose not to love him. They chose to disobey him and they ate from that tree. And in that moment, God's heart broke because he knew that there were consequences to that sin. He knew that that meant that there would be a separation between him and the humans that he had created out of love. And there was a dilemma that rose up for God, a dilemma because you see, on the one hand, God is merciful and he is love. And he probably could have in that moment thought, although he's God, so he probably didn't actually, he's God. But in that moment, he couldn't say to himself, okay, shoot, darn it, they didn't listen. Okay, um, how about this? How about um, a two minute timeout, go put your nose in the corner, right? And then I'll just pick a new tree, okay? This time, listen, this is very important. It's uh, that tree over there, okay? Don't eat from that one, right? His love and his mercy made him want to be with the people, but he also was just. So this dilemma arose. He's also just and truthful. So he couldn't just say, oh, do over, let's try again. No, he had to follow through with what he had said. But in that moment that they sinned, he had a plan. He had a plan that he put into action to bring them back. 
And that plan is unfolded all throughout the Old Testament. We see this whole process of God just trying to come back to be with his people, to be able to be with his people again. And that plan culminates with the sending of his son, Jesus. He sent his very own son down to earth. You know this story, right? He suffered, he died on the cross. And when Jesus died on the cross, he reversed what happened in the garden. And all of a sudden, we could be with him again. Sin and death were conquered. And we could be with God again through the sacraments here on earth, through the Holy Spirit, and one day forever in heaven. We could finally be with him again. Now, I can tell you this story, and you can listen to it as a story, but here's the thing. If you don't believe it from the depths of your heart, if you don't truly believe that you have a God that loves you infinitely, and that sent his son to die for you, and that wants nothing more than to just be with you, it's just gonna be a story. And you're never gonna feel like you truly belong, truly belong to this family. And I get it, it's a hard thing. It's a really hard thing to wrap your mind around. And in fact, some of Jesus' own followers had a hard time comprehending this fact that God wanted them, that he chose them and that they belonged. So I wanna look at one such story. It's the story of Matthew, and it comes to us from Matthew chapter nine. So this is Matthew's own account of his own story of when God called him. So Matthew chapter nine, verse nine begins with this. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at a tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he sat at table in the house, which is presumably Matthew's house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? So here we have Jesus and he's hanging out with Matthew, who's a tax collector. And the Pharisees are likening Matthew and, Je- no, Matthew and the sinners, the tax collectors and the sinners, they're the same thing. It's like, a, it's like a synonym, they're the exact same thing. So why, why don't the Pharisees like the tax collectors? Well, two reasons. First of all, they work for the Romans and they don't like the Romans because the Romans are ruling over them and the Jews wanna rule over themselves. And so the Romans are the enemy. So if you work for the enemy, you're on the bad list. Secondly, they don't like Matthew because he's a tax collector. And tax collectors have a reputation of being a little crooked, a little shady. You see, the job of a tax collector was to go around and collect taxes. And how he made his money is he would say, okay, let's see here, this guy owes a hundred dollars. They didn't call him dollars. I actually don't know what they called him. I should have looked that up. hundred pieces of money is what you owe, right? And then he would go to the guy's house and he would say, listen, hey, um, you owe 110. And then he would pocket 10 and give 100 over to the Romans. And that's how they made their money. So sometimes they would just inflate how much they were supposed to make off of this gathering of taxes. And so they were seen as greedy. They were seen as crooked. And so I get it. The Pharisees are like, seriously, Jesus? Like, this is who you're going to pick. You've got 12 guys that you're going to put on your A team. And you're like looking around going, yeah, the crooked thief, I'll take him. He's going to be perfect for what I have planned right? Doesn't really make sense. And in fact, Matthew himself was probably a little bit surprised by this choice. There's this great painting by a painter named Caravaggio. It's this painting of the call of Matthew. And I want to throw that picture up there so we can see what this painting look like, looks like. So here we have this image. And in this picture, we can see on the one side is Jesus, and he's pointing kind of follow the light there to Matthew, who's in the center of his tax collector buddies. And he's pointing at himself and you can see that surprise on his face. He's like, me? Like Jesus, you, you want me? And if you look at this scene, it's kind of interesting. It looks like they're kind of in the like back alley of some pub or something. It's like this dirty room, like the window is so dirty that you can't even see through it. And Matthew, there he is, he's surrounded by his tax collector friends. And they're all dressed up in their fancy clothes, and, which is very much in contrast to Jesus. And standing in front of Jesus, if you can see that, is Peter. Peter's kind of blocking our Lord, like, what are we doing here? And so we've got Peter and Jesus on the one side. You can't see it in the picture here, but they don't even have shoes on. So they're barefoot compared to these rich guys who have all of these, you know, fancy clothes on. 
And the guy in the very bottom left, you can see his hands. He's hoarding his money. So he's seen this outsider come in and he immediately like grabs for his money. He's like, don't you dare. Like this, this is my money. And then his buddy sitting on the booth in the middle there, he's got, he's got a sword and he's got his hand on the back of the sword. Like he's about ready to get up and his hand, if you look closely, is reaching for his sword because he's going to make sure that he protects his money. So these are the guys that Matthew's hanging out with. These are the guys that, that Jesus is choosing from. And so he comes along and, you know, he calls Matthew and he invites him. And Matthew's got this look of surprise on his face. Now, you might look at that picture and be like, that's interesting. Like, why do those guys on the left look like they belong in a Renaissance festival? Yeah, that's because Caravaggio was painting at the time of the Renaissance. And it was popular, it's a popular thing to do in art to draw the people, the subjects, to look as if they are the people of the time. And so he's painting this image to look like these are people of his day. So I want you to do this with me for a minute. We're gonna update this picture here and I want you to picture this, okay? You're gonna be Peter, at least that's presumably Peter who's standing in front of Jesus. Okay, so Peter, Peter is um, with Jesus and Jesus says, hey Peter, I gotta go see about a friend, come with me. And you're like, okay, so here you go. So you, you follow Jesus and you go to this club and you go past the bouncer and you're walking in and everybody's all dressed up and there's like cocktails on these high top tables and you're in your jeans and you're like, I'm feeling a little out of place right now, Jesus, where are we going? And he takes you to this back corner of this club and there's this curtain there and another bouncer and Jesus is like, I'm here to see Matthew. You guy's like, go ahead. So he lets him in, you go in this room and there's these guys sitting around a table. There's like smoke filled up in the room. They're wearing their Gucci. There's guns on the table, there's like stacks of cash. And you're like, is this how it's gonna end, Lord? Like, <laughs> what are we doing here? Like, wh why did you bring me here? Who are these guys? And Jesus looks at you and he says, I came for Matthew. I came for Matthew because he belongs to me. That Matthew guy, he's mine. You see, here's the thing. Jesus later goes on to explain to the call of Matthew that he came for the Matthews of the world. He came for the sinners. He came for those who maybe didn't feel like they belonged. Even if we don't want it, even if we don't feel worthy of it, even if we don't think we belong. The thing is, friends, if there's anywhere that you belong, it's here. And I know for me personally, learning this truth was a hard one. It was a really hard one. See, like I said, my sophomore year, my mom made me go to this Jesus thing. And much to my surprise, I really enjoyed the other kids who were on the trip with me. And so we came back and I started going to youth group on Sunday night just to hang out with my new friends. And, uh, and eventually I got really good. I got some Jesus t-shirts and, and I knew how to sing those praise and worship songs without holding my hand, looking like I had a question, right? I got really good at that, raising my hands up. And that was me on Sunday night. But the problem was that, that there was another Lisa who hung out on Friday night. And Lisa on Friday night would have been really surprised to meet Sunday night Lisa. Because Lisa on Friday night, she went to the parties. She hung out with her boyfriend. She was all involved in all the crazy, doing things that she didn't want her grandma to know about, right? So there was Sunday night Lisa and there was Friday night Lisa. And there was kind of a tension between these two things. And for a long time, I knew something was off. I knew something wasn't quite right. But I was afraid to go all in on Jesus. I was really afraid of this because, you see, I was kind of like Matthew. I had sins in my life. I had doubts. I wasn't really sure if this whole Jesus thing was actually going to work out for me. I got a question for you. We're going to shift gears here. Have you ever heard of Marie Kondo? Yeah, that's right. She's going to talk about Marie Kondo. That's right. Marie Kondo. Some of you are like, no. Okay, well, those of you who don't have Netflix, let me explain, okay? Marie Kondo is this Japanese woman who has a magical way of tidying up her house. Yes, she has this book. It's called The Life-Changing Habit. No, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. And in Marie's book, she has this whole method for tidying. It's called the KonMari method. So what Marie does, she comes to your house and she says, okay, this is what we're going to do. She starts by taking all of your clothes and putting them in the middle of your room. And she has you go through each item of your clothing one by one. So you hold it up and you ask yourself, okay, 
does this item of clothing spark joy in my life? And if it does, then you put it in the keep pile. And if it does not spark joy, then you thank it for its service and you put it aside for something else to use, somebody else to use. Now she does this because she's of an Eastern spirituality, so she believes that each item has a spirit. Okay, as Catholics, we don't believe that. You don't need to thank your t-shirts for their service, okay? You don't need to, just, just give them to goodwill, okay? So Marie, her method is so popular that Netflix has turned it into a TV show. And now on Saturday nights, millions of people sit around watching other people clean their house. <laughs> people like me. I love organization. I do, I do. It's so fun to me. Okay, so what does this have to do with me trying to figure out where I belong? Okay, well eventually this double life started to catch up with me. Because there was, there was Sunday night Lisa and, and there was Friday night Lisa. And when I was trying to live in both worlds, I felt like I belonged in neither. I felt like I belonged in neither. And so I started to evaluate my life. I started to hold up the things in my life. And I didn't ask myself, uh, not my physical things, right? I didn't start holding up the physical things in my life, but I started holding up the intangible things. And I wasn't asking, does this spark joy? What I was asking was, is this where I belong? So I started to look at my life and I thought, you know, Friday night, like at those parties with alcohol and craziness and drama, like, is this where I belong? Is this even where I want to belong? Or do I belong over here? Do I belong over here on Sunday night where, where I've got this amazing group of friends who love me and who support me and who help me become a better person? Like, maybe this is where I belong. Or do I belong over here? Do you belong over here where, where I'm plagued with guilt and shame and these feelings of just inadequacy and not being enough because the world around me is telling me that I just don't measure up? Like, is this where I belong? Or do I belong over here with a God who, who loves me and who forgives me and says, would you let go of those things? I never intended those for you. I don't want you to hold on to that. Is this where I belong? Or do I belong over here? And this relationship with this boyfriend of mine that is pretty messy, it's pretty unhealthy. Is this where I belong? Or do I, I need to hold him up, feet dangling, and say to myself, is this where I belong? And if it's not, do I need to thank him for his service and put him aside for someone else to use? Okay, people are not things, we don't use them, but you get the point, okay? And as I went through my life and I did this inventory, asking myself, is this where I belong? It took a long time, to be quite honest, because I wasn't quite sure if I could do it. I wasn't quite sure if I could go on all in on Jesus. But when I finally did, when I finally did and I said, you know what? This is where I wanna belong. I wanna belong with a God who loves me. I'm tired of this world over here. I am tired of constantly trying to keep up. I am tired of the drama. I am tired of feeling inadequate. I am tired of feeling like I need to go to confession for things that I just clearly know are wrong. And I said, you know what, I'm, forget it. I wanna go all in. I wanna go all in. I wanna be with a God who loves me, with a God who forgives me. I wanna belong to Jesus. This is who I want to belong to. And so my question for you tonight is the question that I asked myself, that I wanna ask you or invite you to ask yourself, is this where I belong? I want you to start looking at your life, those intangibles, hold them up and ask yourself, is this where I belong? And I'm not asking you tonight to make a decision. I'm actually not gonna ask you to make a decision tonight. I'm not asking you to come up with a plan of action. I'm not asking you to do any of that. I just want you to simply ask, is this where I belong? Is this where I belong? And I gotta warn you, anytime you do this in your life, you start taking stock, you start taking inventory, you start really looking at things. Oftentimes even more questions come up. And I don't have those answers for you right here from the stage, but the good news is, as I know someone who does. I know someone who does. And this person, they are a person, although we don't often think of it this way, but 
this person, the Holy Spirit, has the answers. And so what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna invite the Holy Spirit into this room, into our lives in an intentional way. And we're gonna spend some time right now calling upon the Holy Spirit. Because he's gonna show you, if you let him, if you allow him to, he will work in your life and he will show you where you belong. So I'm gonna start us off with a prayer right now. And Bob's gonna come back up on the stage and he's gonna lead us and continue us in this time of prayer. That's how we wanna start this conference. Just opening our hearts up to the Lord. So join me in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. You are welcome into our lives. You are welcome into those places, those places that maybe sometimes we try to hide from you as if you can't see them. We wanna be vulnerable with you, Lord. We've got three days at this conference, three days to spend with you. Lord, I pray that we don't waste them, that we don't spend them with guarded hearts. We don't spend them stonewalling you, but just being open and receptive. You wanna do something this weekend, Lord, and we're here, we're here. Give us the grace to receive your grace, because without that, without that grace, it's gonna be hard to hear you. Open our hearts, Lord. Open our hearts. Come, Lord Jesus.